Since 1987, we've seen 75 million people come to Christ. 75 million people. We actually only count people that have filled out decision cards. We have wow. their names, addresses, phone numbers, and they've been ushered into local churches to be wow. discipled. We have a question for you. Tell us in one word the most important thing that Evangelist Ron Harbonke ever told you. And I said, okay, I'll give it to you in one word. That in places like America, yeah. we have a lot of evangelists that have become pastors mm, they've been it. they've been tamed True. into say pastors yeah, yeah. and that may be one of the reasons that a lot of them are miserable um, mm. if you want to make an evangelist miserable True. force them to preach to people that are already saved mm. hey guys this is Ben Lim with Ben Lim TV and today we're in Jerusalem Yerushalayim in Israel and my God, we have Evangelist Daniel Kalinda here with us. Wow, such an honor, sir. Thanks, man. Wow, God bless you, God bless you. And uh, uh, I mean, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. You said that this organization, uh, whom you're good friends with, the founder, the director, is all about reconciliation. And uh, even earlier before this interview, we were talking about North and South Korea and mm -hmm. reconciliation. And uh, why do you think reconciliation is in the heart of God right now? Wow. Well, I mean, I think that's part of the gospel, if yeah. not the central message of the gospel. We've been made, we've been called as children of God to be uh, actually ambassadors of reconciliation. Come on. That's what it tells us, I believe it was 1 Corinthians. And that's our job is to reconcile people to God. That's what Jesus died for, was to reconcile man to God. And so for some re reason, God is very interested in that. In fact, mm. I would say it this way, um, if, you, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, for example, it's all about having the right relationship with your, your family, with your friends, with your neighbor, even with your enemies and with God. So I've said it this way, that Christianity is actually the religion of right relationships. Mm. And I use religion wow. in, in, you know, you got to realize the context I'm sure. using it in there. But it's, Christianity is all about right relationships yeah. at its core. Yeah. Right relationship with God, right relationship with, with your fellow man with your neighbor, with the stranger, even with your enemy, God is very interested in that. So it's what, the, what Christianity is all about. Yeah, come on. But so many times, I mean, sadly, it seems like it's easier to bring outside unbelievers into right relationship with God mm -hmm. rather than even in the house. And uh, you're an evangelist, I'm an evangelist myself, and sometimes it seems like it's easier to befriend like people in the world yeah. because they have no concept of religion than yeah. even people in the church. Why, do you think that's true? I mean, why do you think that is, or maybe? Well, if that's true, um, it's, it's uh, indictment because mm -hmm. it's the exact opposite of what Christianity is supposed to yeah, be. Jesus said that they'll, that they'll know that we're disciples by our love for one another. So if, if in the church, within the family, if there's rifts and schisms, which there are, that's a, that's a terrible indictment of the condition of the church. Yeah. And um, it goes completely against the teachings of Jesus. So for example, you know, I mentioned the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, um, if, you, if you go to the altar to offer your sacrifice, and when you arrive, you realize that you have, your brother has ought against you. He says, leave your gift. Yeah. First go and be reconciled to your, to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I want you to think about that for a minute. So what Jesus is talking about, he's picked the pinnacle of the Jewish spiritual religious life. Mm. Going to offer your gift at, the, at your, your sacrifice, that was a once a year activity. Wow. And it's something that you would wait, a religious Jewish male would wait a whole year until their time was scheduled. Oh then they would go to Jerusalem, yes. to the temple. They would wait sometimes all day in line. Mm. And then finally this moment would come where it was the most spiritual moment of their entire religious life. It was time for them to offer their sacrifice. And this is the moment Jesus picks as an example. He doesn't say if you're in the barber shop getting your hair cut and you remember that your brother is out against you. Yeah. He doesn't say if you're standing in line at Starbucks. No, he says if you're at that most spiritual moment, at the altar, at the altar yeah. of the Lord, and mm -hmm. then you remember you have wow. your brother is out against you. He doesn't say, make a note of it, you know, put it down in your smartphone to do later. He says, leave your gift. So what is that? That's actually what I would describe as emergency protocol. That's what happens on an airplane. Wow. They tell you if, if the plane goes down, leave everything behind and get out. It's, it's an emergency. So he's saying in the most spiritual moment of your life, there is something that's more important even than offering a sacrifice to God. Come on. And that is being reconciled Come with on, your preach. brother. And Come so on. this is, if, if Christians could realize how important right relationships are to God, then maybe we would start taking it seriously and, and taking reconciliation with our brother 
more seriously because that's what this whole thing is about. And if we don't live that out and walk that out, how can we call ourselves Christians? Come on, so good, evangelist. Uh, uh, I'm curious, uh, how long have you been with CFAN now? 12 years. 12 years, mm -hmm. and how long have you been, uh, what, the president, or excuse me? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh -huh. about 10 years. About 10 years yeah, now? Not nine plus. Okay, wow, so that's that's quite a long time. You've been with CFAN 12 years, and literally the the headship, the, that leadership got passed on to you just a few years uh, after that. Yeah. Um, how, I mean, how did you feel? I mean, were you nervous? Were you excited? I mean, that's that's a huge weight, literally, of evangelist Reinhard Bonnke, of so, such a legacy in Africa, yeah. a legacy almost like none other, of course, uh, outside of evangelist, uh, you know, Billy Graham. But I mean, how did you feel? How old were you then at that time as well? If I may oh, answer. I must have been 28. 28. When that happened. Yeah, I'm 27. Okay. So I mean, what was going on in your mind at that time? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, the story about how it happened. You know, I don't have to, we don't have time to talk about okay. it, but it, it was an organic process. I actually yeah. started out in the ministry working in the warehouse. So if you, okay. if you looked at a flow chart of the ministry, I was at the very bottom. Wow. I, I literally with had, with CFAN. Wow. So I literally had the bottom wow. position. Wow, so good. And, um, and I was faithful there, and you know, step by step, God began to promote me, which is a wonderful thing. I love to say it because for, for the one that's, you know, maybe they're in a ministry or not even in the ministry, yeah. maybe they're just serving somewhere maybe they're cleaning toilets and they feel like god doesn't know that they're there he knows and he sees and uh, he can lift you up from any from any starting point but um eventually i became a, an assistant for reinhardt and i would travel with him as an assistant and then um, i actually ended up leaving cfan and starting my own ministry and then i came back wow. so but the, the thing was when i came back evangelist bonky asked me to preach for him I, in the beginning, I was only preaching for 10 minutes in each service. Yeah, yeah. And then he, would, he asked me to do one service, and then two, and then three. So it was a gradual uh, handover. It wasn't like literally from one day to the next. Yeah. It, was a, it was a process. And so by the time um, it was official, I'd already been doing the work. So it was just a change of a title. Wow. And, and that made it, it quite easy. Now, the thing is, um, definitely at every step of the way, it's been a matter of something way bigger than me. And it's been over my head and above my pay grade or whatever metaphor you want to use. But um, I, here, here's the thing that's brought me comfort all along. I never asked for this. I never even imagined that it would happen. Mm. In fact, when Evangelist Bonke told me that he wanted, that, that the Lord spoke to him and that I was going to be his successor, mm. when, when the words came out of his mouth, I didn't get it because it never had occurred to me wow. before. It took me a minute even just wow. to figure out what he was trying to say. So... Um, Many times when I get into these situations where um, I, it's, I'm, I'm in over my head, I just pray and I say, Lord, you know, I didn't, I didn't call myself to this. I didn't, I didn't manipulate this. I didn't orchestrate this. You put me in this position. Come on. And if you put me here, then you must know something about me that I don't know yet. Wow. And so I, I, it gives me great comfort because I know His yeah. grace is going to be there. And so far, at every step of the way, His grace has covered me. And uh, so far, it's been... A, absolute dream wow if the only thing that worries me is that it's going so well yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah, yeah. And, and that's normally when we gotta be aware of yeah. the lookout right yeah 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 and um now you're entering into cfat is entering to a decade of double harvest yeah and a uh, harvest the sickle souls evangelist billy graham going home to be with the lord at the age of 99 to to leave for the one mm -hmm. and uh, i mean there's just so many words going on right now uh even the call turning into the scent yeah. you know power evangelism todd white is is doing such an amazing job literally training mobilizing thousands of people in power and love and uh talk about going into the decade of the double harvest yeah uh, i mean like is Africa like the main territory that you're looking at? Or like Evangelist Reinhard Bonnke, is that burning in your heart? All of America shall be saved as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, just talk with us. Well, I mentioned before, when yeah. a lot of people talk about having a burden for a particular nation yeah, yeah. or ethnic group or whatever, I, I've never been that way. Okay. Although I felt called to Africa since I was a boy, yeah. um, I, I realized that Jesus loves people. You know, when, when Jesus spoke to Peter, he, um, after he rose from the dead, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord. Then he said, feed my sheep. And I, I realized when I read that, that Jesus didn't say, Peter, do you love my sheep? He said, Peter, do you love Come me? On. Come on. So Jesus meant for Peter's ministry to the sheep 
to be motiva motivated primarily by his love for Christ, not by his love for the sheep. And so I think that when you love Jesus, you love people. That's mm -hmm. the natural outgrowth. So wherever we go, um, whether it's America, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Israel, yeah. we love people because Jesus loves them and died for them. However, I mean, my assignment, I would say the place that God has really assigned to CFAN and by extension to me in a very specific way is Africa. Yeah. What we see on, on the African continent, no one has ever seen before. Come on. It's, it's absolutely unique. We've Come seen, on. since 1987, we've seen 75 million people. 75 to Christ. million people. And, and when I say that, I'm not just talking about like a, like a lot of ministries estimate or sure, sure. they have a different, different ways of like, some people talk about evangelistically speaking. Uh -huh. It's a way of saying evangelist know. exaggerate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. We actually only count people that have filled out decision cards. We wow. have their names, addresses, phone numbers. And they've been ushered into local churches to be wow. discipled. And ushered. Yeah. Wow. So we only count those. Uh, so th that's 75 million wow. since 1987. And I felt now, um, a, a couple years already ago, I felt already that the Lord was, was calling us to come into a new season of harvest. You see, here's the thing. I learned this from Reinhardt years ago. Okay. Nothing diminishes in God. So God's, God's desire for us when things go from one generation to the next, yeah. is never that we would just maintain or coast or gradually go downhill and die a slow death. This is what's happened with many denominations. Yeah. You know, um, one person, one man had a great vision, yeah. and then the next generations just tried to maintain that legacy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember Reinhardt looking at me when we had a, uh, an event. In the middle of his message, he looked at me and he said, Daniel, you are not to become the custodian of my legacy. Ooh, Jesus. Sure. It brought tears to wow. my eyes, like wow. it's almost doing right now. Yeah. And, and I said, I agree. As wonderful as the legacy is, we're not here to maintain one another's earthly legacies. We're here to build God's eternal kingdom. Come on. And so um, the way that it works, when you read the scriptures, it never diminishes. When, when Elijah passed his ministry to Elisha, Elisha's uh, prayer was for a double portion. Come on. When uh, it went from Moses to Joshua, Joshua fulfilled actually what Moses wow. had been called to fulfill. He saw the fulfillment of Moses' own vision. Um, when Jesus passed his ministry on to the disciples, he said, these works and greater will you do. So that's always the biblical perspective yeah. is that, that when it goes to the next generation, it increases. And so um, I felt the Lord calling me a couple years ago and saying that in this next decade, I'm talking about a 10-year period from 2020 to 2030, yeah, yeah that we are going to see as many people come to Christ in that decade mm. as we th saw in the 33 wow. years come prior. On. Come on. So that's a doubling of that 75 million. So I'm believing God for 150 million souls mm. come on. that will come in name. between 1987 and, to, and 2030. But here's the thing that I think is even more important. You see, I, I just talked to my team last week about this. We had a meeting. All of our leaders came from all over the world. And I said to them, that number, 150 million, which we have a website now, it's 150 million. Yeah. It's become like the motto of the ministry. Yeah. But I said, that's just, that's just something for us to put our eyes on and to shoot towards. You know, I used to be a landscaper. Okay. And when you're mowing, you want to mow a straight line. What you do is you put your eyes on a target straight ahead yeah, of you yeah. and you aim at it. You don't look here, you don't look there, you look ahead. And I said, that 150 million is just something that we're aiming at. But we're going to go far oh, beyond oh, that. Jesus, but we're not going to do it by just working harder. It comes back to what I said yeah, before. Yeah. We're going to do it by sparking a movement of evangelism that is going to go beyond us and beyond our lifetime. Wow. I believe that at the end of that decade, we're going to see literally thousands of evangelists and evangelistic ministries that are doing what CFAN saw in Africa. They're going to be doing it all Come over on. the world. And it's going to be part of the greatest end time harvest in history. Come on. Amen. I, I believe one of my friends prophesied that this is the year of the evangelist, uh, where the mantle of the evangelist where uh, the gift of the evangelist is coming back to the body of Christ again. Mm. And of course, Billy Graham going home to be with the Lord. That is an obvious sign of what's happening in this generation. But you're talking about a double portion of the spirit of evangelism coming on this generation. Lonnie Frisbee, the Jesus People Movement, uh, and, and of course, even Reinhard Bonnke. Uh, but I mean, do you have a Daniel Kalinda that you're rising up right now? I mean, of course, you're far from, you know, uh, you know, passing the baton or anything but I mean is there a Daniel Kalinda or is there just a mass movement that you're training and raising up right now well you know I, I realized that the way most of us do do successors in ministry uh -huh. is that 
when we get to be 80, then we start looking for somebody. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I realized that Jesus did it the other way. When Jesus went, in, went, to, went into his ministry, the yeah. very first thing he did was to pick disciples. Come on. He didn't wait till the end. He started yeah. with that. And then he spent his life training them. And so um, even, even years ago, I took um, a group of men. I took six guys. And for a year, I just, I, I figured Jesus had 12, so I could do ha- at Come least on. maybe half. Yeah. You know, so I took six and for a year just worked with them and trained them. And those guys now are all in ministry. They have their own ministries all over the world. Many of them are doing mass crusades, come seeing on. hundreds of thousands of people come to Christ. Come so it's, it's really rewarding. Even a couple of my assistants now have their own evangelistic ministries. So we, I've seen this happen without me really trying to, uh, I, don't, I don't have any authority over them. I don't tell them what to do. Um, they just have seen the example and they've, yeah. they've run with me. And, and they've been inspired by what they've seen, and they're going and doing it. And that's the greatest joy that I could have. I don't want to control anyone. Uh, I don't want to manipulate anyone. But I'm so thrilled when people catch that fire for evangelism. But what I'm seeing, I, I believe, in this next decade is, like I said, I, I really believe that thousands of young men and women are going to catch the fire for this thing. And to whatever extent I can, I want to bless them, and I want to help them and push them forward. And I've jokingly said many times, at the end of that decade, I think I'm going to retire. Mm. And uh, mm. it's, it's half joking because I don't really intend to sure, stop sure. working for the Lord. Yeah. But what I do believe is I, I believe that God is going to do something in that 10-year period and raise up so many other people that it's going to be so far beyond us. It's no more about Daniel Kalenda and Christ for All Nations Come doing on. these big crusades. Yeah. We'll be one grain of sand on a huge beach. We'll be one drop of water in the ocean. And it will be God's kingdom. And, and I, I believe what you're saying is true, that, that we are entering into a season of evangelism being restored to the body of Christ. It's not going to happen in a year, but it's going to happen. And the way that it's going to happen is we've got to have evangelists with their voices being heard again. Because that's how you get evangelists. You, you, wow. Right now, the way it is, especially in America, and I think in many parts of the world, is that the, the pastor is really at the forefront. Sure, sure. So the, the, the major voices that we hear, the major personalities that we follow tend to be mostly pastors or maybe itinerant preachers, but sure. not true evangelists. And the, and the problem with that is I love pastors and God, we need pastors. Yeah. I bless, you heard me talking about the gifts before. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the problem is that you teach what you know, but you can only reproduce what you are. So oh. a pastor is going to produce pastors. Yeah. And so even when a pastor, like a lot of times pastors will say to me, why do I need an evangelist in my church? Mm-hmm. I can preach the gospel. Yeah. And I said, you know what? You can probably preach the gospel mm. better than an evangelist because mm. you're, you're, you're a great preacher. But the problem is you're going to create other pastors that preach the gospel. Mm. If you want to reproduce evangelists, Come you've got to have the voice of the evangelist Come being on. heard. That's Whenever good. I go out and preach the gospel, I, every single time people come up to me afterwards and they say to me a couple things. Number one, I've never heard anything like that before mm. wow. because that, there's something different about yeah. the way an evangelist presents yeah. the gospel, the urgency, the intensity. The, the, the laser-like focus on the cross. That's all very unique to the evangelist gifting. But the other thing is, I hear people saying, I want to be an evangelist. Come on. Because they see it, they, they experience it, yeah, and then they yeah. want to do it. And so I, I really believe that in places like America, yeah. we have a lot of evangelists that have become pastors. Mm, they've, been, they've been tamed True. into same. pastors. Yeah, yeah. And that may be one of the reasons that a lot of them are miserable. Um, mm. If you want to make an evangelist miserable, sure. force them to preach to people that are already saved. Mm, wow! But uh, let let the evangelists hear that gift being expressed. Let them be inspired by it. I saw Reinhard Bonnke, and I knew immediately that's what I'm that's what I'm called to do. Come on. And I think that's that's what's needed again. Come on, amen, amen. Uh, uh, what was some of the things that really imparted you, marked you from evangelist Reinhard Bonnke? Wow, I'm that, sure there's that's so a, many. Yeah, that could be a whole documentary. Exactly, and it will be. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I was at a school of evangelism uh-huh. a few years ago in London, and afterwards, a couple young guys came to me, really on fire, young evangelists, and they said, "We have a question for you. Tell us in one word the most important thing that evangelist Ron Harbonke ever told you." And I said, "Okay, I'll give it to you in one word: obey." Come on. And I could tell you many stories of how I've seen. In, in very difficult situations, how he chose to obey the word of the Lord, despite every indication in the natural that it was the wrong move. He'd heard from the Lord, he chose to obey, and in the end we saw a glorious breakthrough. And on the outside, people just think, well, it's Reinhard Bonnke, he's an amazing man, and he's a great preacher, and he's so smart. 
But from those of us that know him and have seen the journey behind the scenes, we know it's not just because he's so smart, even though he's very smart, mm. not just because he's a great preacher, although he is uh -huh. a great preacher, but the one thing that I've seen that sets him apart is that he knows how to obey. Mm. And it's radical, it's immediate, it's exhaustive, and I believe the Lord honors that. Wow, amen. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. Yeah. And uh, uh, I want to ask you one more question, evangelist. For some of those young people who are watching now, or even older, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I believe that there's such an impartation that you have and you carry of knowing how to honor the general, the father of the faith, mm -hmm. uh, Reinhard Bonnke, and at the same time, uh, moving forward in what God has called you as well. And so that tension sometimes of honor, mm -hmm. but as well having your own identity. Yeah. Uh, but what would be your advice for some of those people watching now who are saying, you know, I, I want to become my own. I want to take this to the next level, but it's difficult for me to honor. You know, how, how do we go about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the greatest examples of that is David. Because da David had already been anointed as the king yeah. of Israel. But he had to wait several years uh, whilst, while, while the king was still alive. Yeah. And he had, to, he had to learn how to honor in the process, even though Saul... And, and, and I'm not comparing anyone to Saul. I'm not saying that the person that, that you're coming up under is Saul. Come on. But what I am saying is that sometimes there is a transition period where God calls you to honor someone despite what you feel you should do in your own heart. And God will never hold that against you when you honor the one that he's put over you. Mm. Um, I, I've said this before. I think this is, this is really wisdom, especially for young people, that the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. Mm. So there, there's always, especially in the prophetic, especially when we're young, there are lots of things that are just boiling and stirring mm. in your soul. You want to do them. You're feeling the sense of destiny, what you're created to do. There's a time for that. There's mm. a timing. And if you do the right thing at the wrong time, it's the wrong thing. And wow. you can actually sabotage your own wow. destiny. So, so I believe you, that you'll never regret honoring the people that God has put over you in authority. And if you're faithful, if you're obedient, God will raise you up. There will come a time where it's your turn to, to express yourself come and to on. do what's in your heart to do. But until then, be humble, be patient, be faithful, and let God lift you up. Come on. Wow, so good, so good. I want to ask you one more question, Evangelist, before we just close off in a prayer of impartation here. Um, what do you think is the greatest challenge right now um, for young evangelists? People who are looking at you, looking at Todd White, uh, and, you know, they're just so mesmerized uh, just by, you know, you being uh, this voice and going after God. But what do you think is the greatest challenge of people versus YouTube and watching that and then being a young evangelist wherever they are, whether on the streets or in Africa, uh, in missions with YOM or anywhere? Mm. That's a good that's And a good how can we overcome that? Yeah. I think no from the evangelists that I know, and I know many, yes. because of the position I'm in, I interact with hundreds and hundreds of evangelists, thousands even. I think the number one thing would be discouragement. Mm. Um, because I think a lot of times what happens is a, a person will look at Ryan Harbonke or Billy Graham. They're 25. They don't understand why they're not impacting the world the way Ryan Harbonke did. Yeah. And what they don't realize is that, you know, when Ryan Har tells his story, I, I, I've been with him for many years and I've heard him tell the stories and he talks about how the crowd was this size in one city and then this size and then this size and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And when he tells the story, it just sounds like he went from one great victory to the next. But if you know the, the way that it actually unfolded, you realize that what you're doing is you're looking across a mountain range. You know, when you look at a mountain range, you see all the peaks. Mm -hmm. What you don't realize from one vantage point is that in between there's valleys yeah. and there, there are moments of deep frustration and discouragement. Um, I remember Reinhardt telling the story that in one of his crusades, he was the sound man, he was running the generator, he was running the lights, oh. and he was doing it all, <laughs> yeah, wow. and he was preaching, and while he was preaching, the lights went out. So course, yeah. he decided to go restart the generator, yeah. and he tripped and fell face first into the mud. Wow. And he had, to, he had to get back up after he started the generator and preach covered in mud. Come on, hallelujah. You know, now, there are many opportunities yeah, that yeah. he had wow. and that our team had, even since I've been around, yeah. and I've only been around for a decade. Sure. But... Even in my time, there's been many, many chances to quit. Mm. Many chances to, to say, look, there's way easier things to do. Look, 
if it was easy, everybody would be doing what we do. Oh, wow. it's, the reason that there's so few doing it is because it's really hard, wow. especially to do something that's meaningful. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's easier to go after something that looks good, you know, a big crowd. Sometimes the real fruit is in a small crowd. Mm, come on. Sometimes rather than preaching to 100,000 people that have heard 200 other preachers, sometimes the better thing to do is to go to 10 who have never heard the gospel before. And, and there's this t- season that you go through where you really have to struggle with those things and say, where, where am I bringing real value? Where am I actually building That's the good. body of Christ rather than just trying to build my own ministry? And if you're faithful, you know, somebody asked Reinhardt in one of those Q&A sessions, they said, what's the secret to your success? And he said, perseverance. Mm. Perseverance. Yeah. This is something that so many people lack. It, it's, it's not always about the best preacher. Come on. It's not always about the person that's got the best you know, ministry structure or organizing abilities. It's really, at the end of the day, about the one that sticks, mm. sticks to it. Through the ups, through the downs, through the good and the bad. And... Um, if, if people will learn to persevere, I had an evangelist that met with me once in South Africa, and he said, I want to show you what I'm doing. And he laid out his whole ministry, showed me his crusades and, you know, the, the outreaches they were doing and all this stuff. And he said, he said, now that you've seen my whole structure, what's your advice? Hmm. And I looked at it and I said, it looks like what you're doing is right. I said, there's only one thing I can tell you. Don't stop. Hmm. Come on. Because in 10 years, there's 20 other guys doing this right now, but hmm. in 10 years... Most of them will have quit because it's wow. so hard. Wow. But if you'll stick with it, God will continually lift you up. It may not be overnight, wow. but over time, God will lift you up. And at the end of the day, you'll be able to say, I fought the good fight. I ran the race. I finished the Come course. on. And that's the goal. Come on. Evangelist, last question here. What is one thing that's been keeping you persevering through it all? Hmm. I think I mentioned it earlier, and I'll mention it again because I think it's worth mentioning. When Jesus talked to Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, I, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, then feed my lambs. So again, it wasn't, Jesus didn't say, Peter, do you love my lambs? He said, do you love me? Come on. Because he wanted Peter's ministry to be motivated by his love for Christ. Come on. And the thing that motivates me is my love for Jesus. That's why I keep doing this. Um, I spend a lot of time away from my family. There's, you know, it's, there's wonderful mountaintops there's also deep valleys and in those deep valleys the thing that keeps you going is you hold on to him it's all for him that the lamb who is slain might receive the reward of his suffering wow so good guys i am literally you know about to bust out in tears (laughs) the presence the anointing is just so sweet and strong and evident and uh it's just been such an honor having you you. here with us evangelist daniel galinda and uh, I've personally received and gleaned so much, and uh, I'm sure so many of our viewers are as well. Uh, but before we close off in a prayer of impartation, because uh, I just feel like, man, we hit some real good stuff here. Uh, how can people find you, follow you, uh, support you in all of your ministry? Yeah, well, our ministry's website is uh, cfan.org. That stands for Christ for All Nations, cfan.org. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Pretty much everywhere that social media exists. So cool. we'd, love, we'd love for you to follow. I also have a blog at danielcalenda.com. Danielcalenda.com. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Evangelist, it's been such an honor having you. Um, I feel for those people who want to go after God, want to see the souls, the crusades, the stadiums, uh, who want to be like Billy Graham, like Evangelist Reinhard Bonke, like Daniel Kalinda, but those people who are you know, about to throw in the towel, burning out. Uh, um, uh, can you pray an impartation for them that they'll feel the fire again? You were just in, in Canada doing a conference, you know, light the fire again. And can you pray and release an impartation yeah. that their fire will be lit up? And as well, uh, the, the spirit of an evangelist and whatever just comes to your heart, just please have your liberty right now. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Just uh, if, if you need this, if you want this, just do something by faith right now. Just take your hands and stretch them out towards the screen or lift them up in faith and just receive this. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, you see that brother, that sister that's watching, that's Mm. listening. Lord, you know the struggle. You know the things they go through. You know the thoughts they have. You know the way the enemy tries to tempt them and trip them and block them. And Lord, I just thank you for, number one, your grace. 
that would just flow down over their lives? Would they sense at this moment just a reviving in their own soul? Lord, may they just sense those dreams coming back to life again. Would, would you sweep away all that discouragement and all that frustration? Would you cause them just to sense a surge of your anointing flowing through their lives? Lord, remind them that you are the one that called them. Lord, remind them what it is that they first fell in love with. It wasn't a ministry. It wasn't an opportunity. It was you. And Lord, I pray that that first love would be reawakened in their hearts. Lord, that they would take hold of you again and that they would do this not out of love for anything but you, not yes, trying to build Jesus. a ministry, Lord, not trying to become a somebody, but Lord, just loving you and serving you and doing whatever they do for the sake of your glory and the sake of your name. Lord, I pray that your fire would fall on them right now. Lord, wherever they are, in, in their living room, in their bedroom, even driving down the road, I pray, yes. Lord, that the Holy Ghost would just come and would just consume their soul right now with a burning fervency and a passion that would be so deep inside of them, Lord. It would be unexpressible beyond words, beyond human feelings and emotions. Yes. Lord, that it, would, that it would set them on fire. Lord, that they wouldn't burn up, that they wouldn't burn out, but that they would burn until you come again. Yes. That they would burn with the fire of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray for ah. visions and dreams. Yes. I pray for... Lord, words of wisdom and words of knowledge and for the gifts of the Spirit, tongues and interpretation of yes, tongues Lord. and prophecy and faith and healing and miracles and all of your gifts, Lord, that they would just be awakened in their hearts. Lord, put in them a burden for souls as they've never yeah. had before. Yeah. Lord, let it, let it be a burden that they live with, that they sleep with, that they wake up with, that they go to sleep with. And every moment of the day, Lord, would that be the burning passion of their lives, I pray. And Father, I, I pray that at the end of the day that they would be faithful. I pray that they would be fruitful. And I pray that they would be fulfilled in what you've called them to do. In the mighty name of Jesus.